Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is May 11th, 2021. Let's talk about an excellent article on BoxingScene.com today. It's a taboo subject. It's on brain injury, CTE, in professional boxing. And it's written by Muhammad Ali's authorized biographer, Thomas Hauser, right? A great writer of boxing. Well, Hauser talks about how in his role as Ali's biographer, he had access to a lot of Ali's medical records. And it was clear to him looking at the medical records and talking to Ali's healthcare providers, that Ali's physical condition was caused in large part by boxing. Now that's not the way they sold it to the public. We were told that Ali suffered from something called Parkinson's syndrome, that he would have gotten Parkinson's syndrome whatever he did, right? That this was some kind of health-based condition that was independent of boxing. Folks, we're finding out in this article by Thomas Hauser that that clearly was not the case, right? I would argue too that if you look at Ali's career, in the 1960s, he has his faculties, he's fluid, he prided himself on not getting hit. He's fighting heavy punchers, Sonny Liston, Ernie Terrell, George Chevallo, and he's not getting hit hard with any punches. You get to the 70s and by the time the rumble in the jungle takes place with George Foreman, Ali is getting hit repeatedly with shots, right? The rope-a-dope involved Foreman throwing a high volume of power shots on Ali, who is laying on the ropes, encouraging Foreman to throw himself out, right? Well, if you look at Ali's fights in the later part of the 1970s, you're going to see a fighter who clearly did not have the coordination that the younger Ali had, right? Ali in public, right? His speech starts to become mumbled, right? You would hear Ali talking. You couldn't quite understand what he was saying. It sounded like he was mumbling. The concern was so great. And I remember I was watching NBC. I believe he was on with Tom Brokaw or someone like that. And they were asking him about why he wanted to continue fighting. And the questioner questioned him about his speech. They even showed clips of young Ali, right? Where he had the gift of gab. And older Ali where he clearly didn't. Now understand, when Ali fights his former sparring partner, Larry Holmes, right, that fight ends with Holmes begging the referee to stop it. Right, Dundee, in Ali's corner, is telling Ali he's going to stop it. Right, that fight is stopped. But understand, it's a rare fight where the opponent knew Ali better than most of the public. I encouraged the boxing press to talk to Larry Holmes. Larry had been with Ali so long that Larry actually fought on the Thriller in Manila undercard. Right, Larry had been in the ring with Ali several times 
as Ali's sparring partner. Holmes knew something was wrong. Dundee knew something was wrong. Dundee, Ali's longtime trainer. Well, after that Larry Holmes fight, Ali would go on to fight Trevor Burbeck. Well, let's just say, I'm glad we're now hearing the truth with regard to Ali's condition. Right? I believe we need to just be open in terms of the heavy risks that athletes in sports like boxing and pro football are taking. Right? I think it's a mistake to try to make a situation like Ali's situation appear as if it's not boxing related for political reasons. Well, let me just add in a few additional facts to the Thomas Hauser piece on BoxingScene.com today, and it's a must read, right? Let's all come to grips with the fact that boxing is extremely dangerous, right? I love the sport. I don't think they'll ever be able to fully police the sport. All you have to do is listen to Manny Pacquiao talk about how he was poor, how he had problems getting food, and how boxing changed his life. Right? There are many, many, many people like that. Understand, fighters are so desperate that you have Hall of Famers, Harry Greb, Joe Fraser, who we're now learning fought a huge portion of their careers blind in one eye, right? That's the risk fighters are willing to take in this sport. Well, they mentioned Jerry Quarry. Now, I want people to understand who Jerry Quarry was. In my favorites folder right now is a film of Jerry Quarry stopping Ernie Shavers early dominant performance right quarry was not a great white hope quarry was actually a legitimate contender who had some great fights in his prime and who fought people like shavers like muhammad ali well just to understand that in the mid 70s we were wondering what was wrong with Jerry Quarry, right? Back then, we didn't have a conversation about brain injury for fighters. We didn't understand that a fighter who physically looked like he was in the prime of his career could suddenly lose coordination in the ring, would suddenly start getting hit with shots that used to miss him. Right? Didn't seem to be himself. Well, understand, not only did Jerry Quarry end up with brain injury, but I want you to consider what happened to his brother, Mike Quarry, who was also a ranked fighter. Mike Quarry was a light heavyweight. Understand, both Jerry and Mike Quarry ended up with brain injury. In other words, you can't tell who's predisposed to get brain injury in boxing. Right? You really can't tell. They mention Archie Moore, who fought at an older age than most who was in some brutal fights. I know Archie Moore had a fight where he gets knocked down six or seven times, right? I believe it's the Yvonne Durrell fight, right? Archie was in some rough fights. Archie got stopped by Rocky Marciano. Archie's one of the great light heavyweights in history, right? He fought Marciano, moved up to fight him, right? The light heavyweight title was not enough. He fought Muhammad Ali. Right now, Archie Moore uh, aged well. I remember Archie Moore 
talking to Marv Albert and Ferdy Pacheco on TV, giving interviews, analyzing fights, talking about his own career, talking about young fighters, right? He was a guy who aged well, didn't show any signs of brain injury. But yet, the quarries both die in their 50s because of brain injury. Right? We really don't know. We simply don't know who's predisposed to get brain injury. Let me point out, too, Jimmy Young, I thought he beat Ali. I thought that fight is one of the seminal fights I know of. It was during the Jimmy Young fight, when I was a little kid, that I realized, wow, you don't have to throw punches to win a fight. Right? Jimmy Young was refusing to follow Ali over to the ropes. It's so bad, Ali starts motioning Jimmy Young to come over to the ropes. Now, Jimmy does some questionable things in the fight. He sticks his head outside the you know ropes and stuff like that. But just think about it. Young would go on to beat George Foreman, right? Young was undersized. Young seemed to be a small guy fighting giants. Young was elusive, hard to hit, a boxer's boxer. He's fighting top competition, right? Both Foreman, Ali had been heavyweight champions. Well, I saw Jimmy Young toward the tail end of the 70s in the early part of the 80s. He was barely recognizable. Again, you notice that Jimmy Young couldn't move like he could a few years earlier. It's as if Jimmy Young had aged 10 years in about two years. Right? And understand, because it's boxing, because it's just the fighter and his opponent in the ring with the referee, you notice the deterioration. They can't hide it like they can in football where you're a lineman, but they're other linemen. And they can make plays, design plays in ways where your weaknesses aren't exposed. Right? In boxing, no. You are on the stage. Right? Your slippage is there for everyone to see. So let me talk about something else that isn't mentioned in the Thomas Hauser piece. You know, Freddie Roach, superstar trainer, had a superstar trainer he learned under. Joe Fraser's trainer. Ken Norton's trainer, Eddie Futch, right? Riddick Bowe's trainer, years later. Eddie Futch was one of these guys who, you know, like Abel Sanchez today, trained multiple champions. You knew that if you saw Eddie Futch in a fighter's corner, that fighter had to have something going for him. You knew that fighter had to have some talent. Because Eddie Futch wasn't going to associate with fighters who didn't. Well, let me just say, I remember younger Freddie Roach. He was on TV as a fighter. And there came a time where he had a tough conversation with Eddie Futch, who told him, you need to step away from the sport. Right? Eddie Futch, after being with Freddie Roach for several fights, felt that it was time for Freddie Roach to step away. Freddie was getting hit too much. Now, Freddie, of course, being a young fighter, young fighters are invincible, decided to hell with Eddie Futch. I'm going to continue my career elsewhere. I'm not going to take this old man's advice. Well, Freddie now has speech problems, 
right now obviously we don't have the access to his medical records that Thomas Hauser had to Ali's medical records but let's just say Freddie Roach didn't have these speech problems when he was a fighter right Freddie looks back and in interviews has said that he believes now he should have listened to Eddie Futch. Clearly Futch saw that the reflexes had dimmed. That Freddie was no longer prime Freddie. Let's talk about some other people mentioned in the piece. You know, they mentioned that Floyd Patterson died from brain injury. What I want people to realize is that Floyd Patterson had actually risen to become the athletic commissioner of the state of New York. Patterson was the head honcho there, presiding over boxing in the state. And of course, New York is one of those Goliath states. It's the Empire State, right? People box in places like Madison Square Garden for crying out loud, right? It's a boxing mecca. These days, you have Barclays, right? Back in the day, you also had Nassau Coliseum. People forget about that, right? I believe the rematch, Joe Fraser, George Foreman happened in Nassau Coliseum. Double check me on that. Well, understand words started getting around that Floyd Patterson wasn't himself because the way brain injury works is you leave the sport, you look great, you're giving interviews, you sound great, but your brain is aging faster than it should. So it reached a point where they approached Floyd and they asked him questions about his own boxing career. And Floyd Patterson could not remember some of the major fights that he had. It was then that people understood that Floyd Patterson was suffering from a brain injury. Let me say this too. They interview Mickey Ward in the piece. And Mickey Ward talks about how brain injury affects everyone differently. And that some fighters end up with depression. Right? I want people to think about that when they hear about a great fighter who made a lot of money in their careers, who ends up with financial problems. Right? You need to understand that mental health is one of those things we don't discuss enough. <coughs> Sometimes someone dealing with a mental health challenge will let responsibilities, financial responsibilities, mortgage payments, tax payments, go neglected. Other times, the person will be feeling down. They need to lift themselves up. So they might go on a shopping binge. Right? A depressed person might try to lift themselves up using illegal substances. So I'm not that surprised when I hear that some boxers in a sport, right, where the risk of brain injury is so high, that some boxers, after they leave the stage, and psychologically that's difficult, Right? You're going from being the champion to being a regular person. As time passes, the crowd might forget who you were at one time. They might forget that you were at one time a welterweight champion. Right? A champion at 154, a champion at 168. So I want people to consider the mental health component when they hear about the financial problems some great fighters have had. When they also hear about some behavioral issues. 
that some fighters have had. Right? We have this situation happening in football right now where some former players have committed some terrible violent crimes. Just understand the likelihood of that increases when you have brain injury and you're not able to fully process the situation. We're finding out now that Aaron Hernandez in football had signs of CTE. When he died, they did a cross-section of his brain and they found out that he was in the early stages of CTE. I'm just telling you that that is going to affect your judgment. Let me also say, they quote Kelly Pavlik in the piece. Now, Pavlik retired early. Pavlik had a huge punch. Right? Pavlik believes that the real harm in boxing, the brain injuries are really caused not so much from the fights themselves as from the sparring that's done in preparation for the fights. Right? Pavlik points out that you're often sparring more than a hundred rounds in preparation for a fight. Well, let's dig into this a little bit deeper because Understand, it's not just superstars. Ali, right? Um, Floyd Patterson, both former heavyweight champions who have had brain injury, right? It's not just the superstars. You also have fighters who the public really doesn't know about who end up with brain injury. How can anyone tell a guy who's making a living as a sparring partner that he can no longer ply his trade? Right? Understand, um, I mentioned Larry Holmes, former heavyweight champ. I believe he's great heavyweight, one of the best I've seen, certainly. Was Ali sparring partner for a period of time? Right? You're, you're taking a guy out of Easton, Pennsylvania, and suddenly he's part of the Ali entourage. He's a boxing insider on the highest levels. He's roaming around with a living legend. He's in the ring with a living legend. He's in the gym with people like Angelo Dundee. How could you tell a young guy like that, hey, you can't spar that many rounds in helping this guy prepare for a fight? How many young guys are going to get an invitation to spar with Tyson Fury, which Joe Joyce got, and then are going to say, you know what, I've been sparring too much. I have to think about brain injury. Do you think that paradigm is how it would unfold in the real world? Or do you think these young guys are going to leap at the opportunity? Right? They have their own careers. Larry Holmes had his own career. Joe Joyce had his own career. Right? Don't you think even with the full-time job, their own careers... When an Ali or a Tyson Fury says, hey, player, help me spar. I need great sparring to prepare for this next challenge. I'm telling you that in this sport, guys are sparring hundreds of rounds, right? Not just the star fighter, but the sparring partner. Let me close by saying this. When I was younger, one of the best divisions I ever saw at any point in time was the light heavyweight division right you had so many people in that division it was obscene right Dwight Cowie for example well my favorite fighter in that division was a guy named Matthew Saad Muhammad 
right? Matthew Saad Muhammad to me epitomized the player in boxing, right? He would attend other people's fights. Back then, you know, a fight was about to take place, then they would announce some people in the crowd. And somehow, Matthew Saad Muhammad seemed to be in the crowd, let's say, more times than not, right? It'd be a welterweight fight, and they'd say, oh, and here is the light heavyweight champion, Matthew Saad Muhammad. And he'd be there, and of course, you know, the brother was well-dressed. He was from the Northeast like I was, right? He had all kind of flavor, looked like he was living the life. You thought, man, if there was one fighter I wanted to be, Right? Forget Ray Leonard. Forget Ali. Forget Larry Holmes. You know, make me Matthew Saad Muhammad in another life. Right? Guys seem to just have it going on. Well, of course, he fell on hard times when he left the ring. According to some reports, he died homeless. Now, you wonder, how is that even possible? Because Saad Muhammad was on TV... Saad Muhammad made a lot of money. It's really hard to imagine until you understand that Saad Muhammad was in wars. The reason he was Matthew Saad Muhammad was because he was a guy who emerged victorious from wars. He threw a lot of punches. He got hit with a lot of punches. Unfortunately, people, you know... Health is a very private thing. People don't talk about it openly. When you hear that Matthew Saad Muhammad was homeless, you think, oh man, he didn't spend his money right. Not that the guy may have faced some mental health challenges because of all the great fights he gave us. Right? Let me say this too. They mention Aaron Pryor the Hawk. In the BoxingScene.com Thomas Hauser article. You know, the Hawk, they talk to his widow, who talks about his mental health challenges, right? His brain injury. But understand how brutal the sport is. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Hawk ends up blind in one eye. He had such a hard time walking away from the sport that he actually went shopping for a place that would allow him to fight. And then he found a state that didn't allow discrimination against the disabled. I believe that's how he ends up in his last fight. It's so poignant that Alexis Arguello, great champion who himself battled depression, right, ends up committing suicide, by the way. But Alexis Arguello pleaded with Aaron Pryor, who fought Arguello twice, who beat Arguello twice, right? We'll overlook the Panama Lewis situation in the first fight, right? But Alexis Arguello pleaded with Aaron Pryor not to go forward with the fight because Arguello could see that Aaron Pryor was no longer Aaron Pryor. Right In the Hauser piece, Pryor's widow laments the fact that Ali's family didn't publicly announce that Ali's condition was caused by boxing. Because Pryor's wife believes, given Ali's stature, that may have convinced Pryor to walk away from the sport. Right, And keep in mind, Pryor, of course, blind in one eye, while dealing with mental health challenges. So let me just give my highest rating to the Thomas Hauser piece on BoxingScene.com today. It is a must read. Let's all understand the risks these guys are taking in hopping in the ring. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.